wow, it's, it's really cold in here. <laughs> Nobody prepared me for how cold it was gonna be in here. I'm, I'm shivering. <sighs> this is not the most comfortable outfit, not a good choice of shoes. My feet are killing me, <sighs> which would be okay if only I weren't so tired. My kids were up really late last night, as usual, so I'm just, just exhausted. But whatever, it's fine. It is what it is. Okay, let me pause and breathe. What you just heard me do before I took a pause is something that happens all the time, at home, at work, in many different parts of our lives. Simply put, complaining. For many people, and certainly for me, complaining is a very natural way of communicating. I could have kept going for quite a while. <laughs> Unfortunately, conversations filled with complaints usually don't go that well. I mean, imagine that you and I were talking in real life, and I kept going on and on about my uncomfortable shoes and lack of sleep. Odds are good that by the end of our chat, both of us would feel pretty frustrated. However, there's more to complaining than you might imagine. Once we recognize what's really going on underneath complaints, we gain power over them. Power to understand why they're so frustrating. Power to avoid reacting to them in ways that just make things worse. And what's most exciting, power to transform the challenges we're complaining about from burdens into opportunities. So what is really going on underneath complaints? It is simply this. Whenever we complain, there is something that we want and may really need, but we're not expressing it directly. For instance, when a child gets stuck in complaining, often they have an underlying need to feel more connection and support. But that's not what they say. They don't express it directly. This happens with my twin daughters, Abby and Sammy, particularly in the back seat of my car. They don't say, I'm feeling tired and lonely. I could really use a little downtime and a hug. Instead, they whine. Oh, mom, why do we have to go to the grocery store now? It's so boring. Why can't we just go home? And a very similar thing happens in the workplace. For example, many employees want greater autonomy, more freedom to choose how they go about their work. But often they don't express that directly and instead they complain. I'm sick of all this micromanaging. The managers here don't trust us to do our jobs. And in the same way, many team leaders want more two-way communication with other teams and other departments. But often what they say is, yeah, of course nobody thought to involve us in those discussions. They never consider how their decisions affect our work. Now, the result of all this complaining is that our attention gets stuck on what we don't want and don't need, our burdens. The flip side, what we do want and do need our opportunity to make things better may never get communicated to the people around us or even to ourselves. So you can start to see how complaining can be counterproductive and it gets worse. Complaining carries an emotional tone, the feeling of being burdened. There is a sense of frustration, resentment, resignation or hopelessness. That's what turns a normal statement like, it's raining again into a complaint. It's raining again. And this emotional tone tends to trigger the people around us to respond in ways that take counterproductivity to a whole new level. Specifically, there are three common types of complaint responses. Hang around with my twins for a day and you'll likely hear all three. <laughs> so say we're all in the car and Abby makes that complaint about going to the grocery store. Her sister, Sammy, may go into response number one, join. Yeah, mom, why do we have to go? You always drag us around on your boring errands. Joining basically multiplies the complaints and gives them more fuel, not an improvement. 
Or sometimes, Sammy tries response number two, fix. But Abby, we could make the grocery store fun. You could get those pretzels you like, or maybe some peaches. You love peaches. Now, from the outside, the fixing response of bringing in solutions may appear very helpful. But remember, the person who's complaining has not directly expressed what they really want or need. So in general, suggestions from other people actually aren't helpful. The typical response from the complainer is, oh, that won't help, which can be very frustrating to the fixer who really believes they have the answers. Now, when this happens to Sammy and she gets frustrated, she tends to go into response number three, which sounds more like, just shut up, Abby. Stop whining or I'll, I'll kick you. We call that attack. <laughs> it's no surprise that that one, too, tends to make things worse. Now, these three responses may sound childish, but we see very similar dynamics in the workplace. So think back to that earlier example. I'm so sick of all this micromanaging. Colleagues may respond to that with a join. Yeah, it's ridiculous. We have no say in how we do our work. Or they may try a fix. Well, why don't you have a meeting with your manager? Sit down and explain your concerns. Or they may attack. Don't be so negative, Sean. Whining about it isn't going to help. And all three of these responses, join, fix, and attack, are just as ineffective in the office as they are in my back seat. So now you know how not to respond to complaining. But what can you do instead? The secret is to remember that underneath every complaint, there's something else going on. There's that underlying want or need. That's the opportunity. One of the most powerful questions we ask in coaching is, what do you really want in this situation? Or what do you really need? You can use this type of questioning whenever you hear complaining from the people close to you, including yourself. If ever the voice in your head starts to sound like my opening monologue, oh, my feet are killing me, I'm so exhausted, you can take that as a cue to pause and ask yourself, what do I really want in this moment? What do I really need? And for me, the answer that comes up most often is, I need to ask for help. My typical complaint is a cue that I've taken on too much. I'm overwhelmed and I've hit my limit. And sometimes I'm like my kids. I just need a little downtime and a hug. This kind of focus on wants and needs has also made me a better parent. It helps me to remember that when one of my kids is complaining, there's an opportunity there. There's a want or need that isn't getting met. When I can keep that in mind, I'm better able to shift from irritation into empathy. You know, hey, honey, it sounds like you're having a really hard time. Help me understand what you need right now. And something similar can help in the office, too. If a friend at work complains about being micromanaged, you can say, it sounds like you're not getting what you want from your manager. What do you really need from her? So if this approach to complaining sounds interesting to you, try it out. See what happens. It's been a great help to me, and I hope that it will be helpful to you and the people you care about. Thank you very much.